I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. My name is Jared Ball. I'm a father. I'm a husband. Uh, as we'll pull up here in a moment, run a multimedia website called I mix what I like dot org. I am also thank you very much. Um, and uh, professionally, I am a full and tenured professor of media studies at Morgan State University in Baltimore. Now, I wanted to say to my, my colleagues here, and I always was, I was quote this quote, that, and I don't know where I got it, so I can't, it's not mine, I can only, that's the only thing I can promise here. But I, it, it is exactly what happened to me. Uh, and the quote goes, you go to undergrad and you, re, you think you know everything. Then you go to get your master's and you realize you don't know anything. And then you get your PhD and you realize that nobody knows anything. <laughs> and I think that's exactly how anyone should approach it. Um, and there's a lot I would love to talk with everybody about uh, separately about the politics of promotion and, and even some of the nightmares attached with promotion and tenure, uh, believe it or not. But uh, um, uh, having some job security is important, especially in this day and age. Um, and especially when you say some of the things that I like to say, which are wildly unpopular. Uh, and that's sort of one of the points that I want to make, that one of the problems that I think we have is in, in this society, maybe more than any other in history, is the association of accuracy, positivity, quality with popularity. And I think we should do all we can to divorce those uh, as much as popular possible. In fact, I often make the comment that uh, given the context of this society, everything that is popular is fraudulent. Everything that is popular is a fraudulent represent representation of whatever it claims to be, whether it's a president, whether it's a man, a woman, uh, uh, racial identification, it's all fraudulent. Um, but for today, just for the limited time we have, let me just, just I just want to make a couple of quick points. I titled this, this, this presentation, uh, Hip Hop's Troubled Narrative, or A Requiem for C. Dolores Tucker. Has anybody ever heard of C. Dolores Tucker? A few people have. Uh, she's important for a lot of reasons, and um, I think misunderstood for even, you know, more important reasons. And I, um, but anyway, what I wanted to start with was that, before I even get into any of that, is that my fundamental problem is now, and has always been, that hip hop as an extension and expression of a colonized population has not, as we have not, developed an organized, and or developed and organized around a sufficiently radical politics. At the end of the day, nothing that I or anyone else says will mean anything for the collective without the development of a well-organized, sustainable, radical political movement. So one of the problems that I've had growing up with hip hop, watching hip hop evolve culturally, watching hip hop academia evolve, watching hip hop journalism evolve, um, not that that singularly makes me an expert in any way, but just my observation and with some study and analysis is that uh, we have separated out the need for that political organization and the, the debate around ideology and politics um, and to our detriment. So as we'll come to in a few minutes, one of the biggest problems that I have with much of the hip hop canon as it relates to hip hop studies and history is that it does just this, that it, it, it denies or omits or limits or reduces or diminishes the concept of a need for radical political organization and has walked away from where the ideological struggles around how we define all of these things needs to be. Um, and I will just quickly summarize that concern with being present at the 2004 National Hip Hop Political Convention and being sorely disappointed at the fact that the, the bulk of the conclusions made there was that we as a hip hop nation uh, radically organizing and moving forward should express that political organization simply through the support of John Kerry's uh, presidential um, nomination bid. I was really disappointed in that. And I think that that spoke to a core problem and still speaks to a core problem we see today around uh, where hip hop is and what this thing of hip hop nationalism or hip hop as a community or hip hop uh, uh, culturally is. And I would add one other thing to my, my bio very quickly for this part of the conversation. I did run briefly in 2007 and eight as the Green Party, uh, running for the Green Party's presidential nomination. 
I stepped back to support Cynthia McKinney and Rosa Clemente, the first all black, all brown, all female uh, presidential ticket in this country's history. And one of the problems that we ran into in, in that campaign was that hip hop was decidedly, and I think blindly in the pocket of the Democratic Party, caught up blindly in the mythology around Barack Obama and didn't even report on one of its most long practicing stalwart activists, Rosa Clemente, not me to a much lesser level, running for president. Like she struggled to break through and a lot of that had to do with gender, a lot of it had to do with uh, um, uh, the mythology around Obama, but core, my core point, and, and I'll move on from here, is that hip hop had not radically organized itself beyond vague notions of hip hop nationalism, culture, identity, etc. So for me, hip hop is a conduit through which I can teach about Africana and media studies. Uh, and the politics and function of popular culture, celebrity, image, and myth in service of power and the power struggle. And in my classrooms, we use Huey Newton's or the ba Black Panther Party's definition of power, which is the ability to define phenomena and have it act in a desired manner. And if you can define something and have it act upon that definition, you don't need any other form of control to manipulate that person. So if you can define black men, as is largely the case today through popular cultural images of what black manhood should be, then you don't have to put a gun to anyone's head and say, behave this way. They will go out and normally do that. So uh, same thing for women or any other categorized segment of humanity. If you promote a popular version of it and can control that and define it, it will have a tremendous impact on lived experiences of people uh, consuming that. Generation, generationally, I come from what is said to be the first hip hop generation who saw hip hop emerge, fight for relevance and survival, and then become corrupted and part of the national popular cultural machinery and control. Uh, uh, whereas for many of you in this room, you were born into a world where hip hop already existed without controversy. I remember hip hop having to struggle for relevancy, saying it's not a fad, it's here to stay, having arguments about uh, uh, its value, having to fight including black radio to be heard, uh, to be played, which if we go back and look, gave a real head start to the commercial trumped up form of the art to get popularized because even black radio wouldn't play the more uh, diverse and often radical form. Um, but it becomes a point today, whereas Marshall McLuhan, the media scholar, famously, or not too famous, or not famously enough, used to say, and I love this quote, where he said, uh, and this I think is the case for those in, in uh, today's generations, is that we don't know who discovered water, but we know it was not the fish. <laughs> An all pervasive environment is always beyond perception. And that's how for many in this generation, many who end up in my classrooms, this is what hip hop was. Hip hop has always been here for them. It's natural, it's normal, and the form that is popularly disseminated to them should be unquestioned because that's just how it has always been and how it should be. And because I was born into it, it, it can't be a created environment because I was born into it, it's just here. It has to be natural. And that's again, one of the biggest problems that we have in this society, unlike many others, where you have the tightest control over who manages popularity than in any other society in world history, they have a, 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 an increasingly decreasing number of people who have a tremendous amount of power over what becomes popular and what shapes public opinion. So if I just said very quickly to the people in the room, just as a quick example that I like to do in, in the classroom, if I said right now, everybody strip buck naked, and walk down whatever street we're on. I don't know where I am, forgive me. <laughs> I, just, just because I'm asking you, and then shout out to the late, great Bernie Mac, I'll ask you the way he would have. Everybody get bucket naked <laughs> and walk down the street. Who would do it? Raise your hand. Okay, so let's say I walked over to my bag and can mythologically or, you know, pull out $10,000 in untaxed cash. <laughs> Hand it to you. Bucket naked, who's doing it for 10 grand cash? Couple hands. How about $100,000? No, no, right. What if I talked to my, my colleagues up here and was like, I will wipe out your student debt? <laughs> <laughs> now, usually I would go longer and longer and longer, and I sometimes would say, or, and, and you know, and uh, we have, we always have a few holdouts and I'll get up to billions and trillions of dollars and there's always a few people that claim at least, I'm not getting up. But my point is, at least at some point you start to think about 
maybe it's time for me to get up and take my clothes off. <laughs> and I only bring this up because one, I just want to quickly, I do this with, in conjunction with another exercise I'm going to do very quickly in a moment to make the point about the function and his, historical function of money because this always comes up in terms of media and hip hop where we only produce what will make the most money and people want money. So therefore, we as consumers dis determine what is the popular form of our cultural expression. And I'm always saying that's not how it works. And money was only invented, and you can go read the godfather himself, Adam Smith, and his section on the origins of money where he talks about this. Money only exists to manipulate people's behavior. That's the only reason it was created. That's the only reason it exists. So when you understand that wealth is not about accumulating more money, but accumulating the power, the power to manipulate other people, what we're going to talk about here in just a moment makes a little bit more sense. And the other exercise is, is how many of you, if, if we were in a classroom, it usually works better this way, but I would say, I will give an A today to the student who, guessing between the numbers 1 and 10, thinks of the number that I'm thinking of. And they never have to come back to class. I'll put the A in Websys right now and we're good. And then I just invite people to guess. I'll do the same here. Guess me between one and 10. If you guess the number I'm thinking, I will give you, well, for today, I can't give a grade. I will give you $100. Go. No. Good try. That was good, but no. No. Three. No. Two. No. Have a good try. You are on it, but no. Anyway, I would let this go and go and go and go and go and go. And then sometimes students are like, well, yeah, I said all the numbers. They start saying, well, 1.3 and 2.5. And my point in all this is to say, and it's always wrong. And then I'm like, well, the answer is 7,020 or whatever. And they're like, well, you set us up. Exactly. This is how media work. This is how popularity works. We give you false range of choices. You think you have choices to make. You use all your intelligence to work within the ranges given to you. And you feel like you're free and invested and you're participating. When in reality, as Edward Bernays, the father of, God, of, of propaganda in this country, said, this country is run by, quote, invisible government that gives you choices that are already predetermined by them so that no matter what you pick, they win, and that's it. From presidents to soap to cars, it doesn't matter. And in our context, to hip-hop popularity and even hip-hop scholarship. Okay. All right, so... One of the things I want to quickly challenge, and this is where I, if, 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 if I had maybe organized this better and I had more time, we could get more into the, 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 the details of what C. Dolores Tucker was arguing. Because C. Dolores Tucker at the time, in the early 90s, was considered an old veteran hag, to put it politely, who was a, a holdover from the civil rights movement, who was, was chastising a burgeoning rap community for all of its gangster rap lyrics that were harming black children in particular. And a lot of people in hip hop, from legends like KRS-One, to Tupac Shakur, to the lesser legends of today like Eminem, had nothing but negative, horrific words to say about this woman. Even at the time, I can't prove this, I didn't agree with what my hip hop world was saying about her. And I thought they were missing the point. And over the years, I've only thought more that she was correct. And her argument, to make it short as possible, was it wasn't that she had a problem with rap music. She had a problem with corporations taking the worst forms of hip hop, popularizing them to create a political ill will and problem for black kids. But one of the problems that emerged is so th this, but what she was doing was challenging what was then an evolving hip hop myth of origin. And myths of origin are essential to individual and group solidarity. So when they're challenged, they become, the challenger becomes a great threat. One of my favorite examples of this, who's here heard of Sigmund Freud? How many of you have read or heard of his last book called Moses and Monotheism? Sigmund Freud, who's considered a pillar of communication studies and psychology, obviously, and propaganda, and public relations, and more, is read widely by millions and millions of people, but almost nobody talks about his last full-length book, Moses and Monotheism. And the reason, I think, is because he was raising serious questions, not only about African history, but myths of origin. And his point was, what happens to a Jewish community that finds out its foundational figure of Moses was not, in fact, a Hebrew, but was, in fact, an African, because Judaism is an African religion. 
What if Moses, who as we're told in the Bible, was in fact born and bred and raised in all the ways in the traditions of ancient Egypt? So the late Dr. John Henry Clark used to say, if Moses, whatever Moses brought up down from Mount Sinai with him, he carried up in the first place because he had already been taught all of that as part of his traditional education in Africa. But Freud's point was, what happens to a Jewish collective that learns that Moses is an African and they're practicing an African belief system at its, at its core. Psychologically, it becomes traumatic. The same thing happened when my, my fifth grade daughter last year was told she could not infuse into her report on the American Revolution work I had helped her with that infused the work of Gerald Horn and his book, The Counter-Revolution of 1776, because that book says the revolution of 1776 was not about freedom and democracy. It was about maintaining and protecting slavery for the American colonies. What? Myth of origin challenge. My daughter is told that the school won't allow her to make that presentation, not because it's wrong, but because the teachers themselves said they didn't understand or know what she was talking about. <laughs> All right. So my point here is that as hip hop was evolving its own myth of origin, saying that black and brown kids coming out of the, the worst communities in this city developed a cultural expression that would allow them to free their minds and their communities that, would, that was brought from the margins into the center of American pop culture and, and, and commercialism, that this is a sort of a linear tra tra trajectory success story. And anyone who would raise a challenge, as C. Dolores Tucker was at the time, not to hip hop, but raising challenges over who was in control and what was, the, what was encouraging the gangsterism in the lyrics, she had to be attacked and dismissed. And I used three examples in some unpublished work that I've been working on for a while. Years ago, I was asked to contribute to the uh, widower of Tucker, uh, an unpublished memoir she wrote. Um, and it didn't get finished. So I have this, a, a lot of, I think, interesting stuff that hasn't gone anywhere yet. So I'll just throw some of it here and we'll move on. There are three examples that I bring to make this point about uh, what hip hop Smiths of origin has gotten wrong and how Tucker fits into this. Um, but the myth is I just quickly described it, this linear, it's not exactly how it works, but th there's a generally encouraged belief in a linear, straight line. We came from, like Drake, came from the bottom, now we at the top. We just start here and now we're everywhere. And get, what gets left out of a lot of that history are the struggles over selling out. Rap is not pop, if you call it that, then stop for instance, or EPMD's The Crossover. What's happening with all this selling out? We don't want to be selling products. That gets moved, and then with the rise of Puffy, Puffy primarily, we get Don't Hate, which is just don't institutionally criticize what I'm doing, um, which is why, by the way, we're about to host our fifth annual Hate Awards. Right? I mix what I like.org. We are haters. We hate on things that prevent revolution and progress, and we try to reclaim. So anyway, but so anyway, you can check that out. Um, but there are three quick examples that. that oh, oh, I'm sorry. But the myth, that myth that I was quickly trying to describe, works to deny the realities involved and contained within the very colonial status and nature of the relationship we have with this society. So that as black and brown colonies, well, as black and brown communities were being developed in this country historically, so too were the traditional colonies everybody recognizes around the world being developed. And as I often like to joke with my continental African students in an attempt to draw and develop some pan-Africanism, is to say, don't look at us as black Americans as being new and inauthentic, because black America is older than Nigeria. Mm. By several hundred years, if you think about it one way, Nigeria is a very recent European creation, as are all the countries on the African continent, as in fact are all the countries on the planet, inspired in response to European imperialism. They're all inauthentic to what they claim to be. But, this, but the point of understanding colonialism and its history is that it should be applied to black America, Latin America, and indigenous America as well to understand the relationship that is an extractive one. So hip hop's popularity isn't so much that hip hop is coming from the margins and helping all these black and poor communities because in fact now economically and materially black and brown people are worse off today than 40 years ago. So clearly hip hop and the billions it produces annually around the world does not eradicate poverty and inequality from in the very communities from which it comes. 
So we can't automatically say, as I'll get to in a moment, as some uh, popular authors and historians have said, that hip hop is an American su capitalist success story, unless you understand capitalist success story as the thriving and triumphant conquering of a colonized people by capitalism. Okay, so three literary examples that I quickly would want to point to that I think help get this mythology wrong. And the first goes to uh, uh, Raquel Cepeda's really important, but I think uh, uh, revelatory work, um, her anthology, And It Don't Stop, which is a collection of what was quoted as called the best American hip hop journalism in the last 25 years. It came out in 2004, but it has a reverberating echo chamber. And in it, here in a male story about C. Dolores Tucker, it exposes, I think, some of this mythology in its infancy, or the attack of the attack of the mythology in its infancy, where Mayo basically dis, dis, she just dismisses Tucker as old, in uh, you know out of touch. Um, I won't, I'll spare all the quotes, but she she misquotes Tucker. She she truncates Tucker's quotes. This happens all the time to depict her in her journalism as this old fogey who doesn't know what she's doing. And hip hop is strong and coming, and here we come, and this is that and that and that. And all I'm really trying to say is that in an, in an endeavor to develop this mythology, to develop a defense for hip hop, to protect this new and burgeoning cultural expression, a lot of us in our own generation his, his, then and continue to get it wrong in terms of understanding the relationship that it, hip hop, and we have to society. The other one is, uh, uh, as was just mentioned, uh, Can't Stop, Won't Stop by Jeff Chang, where he does the same thing to Tucker. And in, this, in, in his attempt to outline in a very important work in the history of hip hop and its emergence, and I agree that he does go beyond and draw some of the context, he, he, he truncates and literally misquotes Tucker to dismiss her and to dismiss what I think is more importantly the critique she was laying down, which is again, that white men in corporate boardrooms are determining what our black children are listening to. And the problem then is that she is more right today, 13 years after her death, than she was when she was saying it in the 90s. We have fewer rich white men controlling more of our black and brown and other world uh, cultural expression than ever. And then the final one that I, I outline in my, my critique here is Dan Charnas' is The Big Payback Book, where he, is, he literally says that hip-hop is an American capitalist success story. And this is where I find a huge problem, because again, if you understand it in terms of American mythology and capitalism, that that is progressive and positive and good, then it is to misunderstand what capitalism actually is and what our relationship to the society is, is, is itself. So we produce the raw material, in this case hip-hop, just like a colony. We produce the raw material that gets taken out of the community selected by those in the colonial motherlands or the oppressive powers for what forms will work for them politically, and then it is promoted and fed back to us, and it creates a feedback loop that we learn about in media studies, very basic, where we end up mimicking what is promoted to us and then looking to feed it back into the system. You know what, I think, because I'm up on about 20 minutes, I think I'm gonna just make one more comment and then wrap it up for now. Excuse me. Yeah, so what we have now is you have three dominant record labels, really just two, that despite what it may look like, and this is another exercise I'll ask you to do, what we usually do it in the classroom, I'll ask you to do this on your own. Just take your favorite artists and start looking them up on Wikipedia, look at the label that they're attached to, click on the label, and then find one of the big three that it's attached to as a distributor, and you'll always get there. You'll always find that every one of them, particularly if you hear them on the radio, particularly if you see them in a video, particularly if you hear them in a movie or in a video game, they're attached to one of these three companies, Universal Music Group, which is the largest, Sony, which is second, and Warner Music Group, which is a distant third. Now, there is no exception to this. Even the claim that Chance the Rapper is an independent has a distribution deal with, I believe it is, Universal. So what it means is that without a connection to one of these three companies, you don't get heard. You don't get rotation on radio. You don't get spins on YouTube. You don't get spins. You don't get placement on Pandora or iHeartRadio or iTunes or wherever else. 
The system, old system of payola still works. And then we also ask people to go to theyrule.net in my classroom, just a, a flash-driven website where you can start plugging in corporations, pulling out their boards of directors, see the interlocking boards of directorates, see who sits on everybody else's board, and then you see that these companies are really not in any competition at all. They're all on the same page, ideologically, racially, class, gender, etc. And then you can start looking them up. Just in terms of the, the real exercise here is that, that ends up working beautifully in the classroom is that you can get to the level of the CEO or the chief executive officer. And we could stop there. And we could say Universal Music Group is Lucian Grange, who is said to be the most powerful person in music. White Frenchman, white male Frenchman. Uh, Sony is, uh, just looked it up, uh, uh, what is his name? Um, Oh, I can't find it. Regular, regular white guy. <laughs> we can just call it that. Regular white guy. Rob Stringer. And then Stephen Cooper of Warner Music Group. But they're not the owners. And what I've, I'll just skip it. When you, if you look, peel back all of the layers, one of the things you find is that corporations exist to hide the identity of those who rule, to make it very difficult for us to identify them. Uh, and to give, as Robert Reich says, uh, the legal fiction protection of a corporation that has the legal status of a human being uh, in this country. Uh, and then worse than that, you have hedge funds and private equity groups that are the major institutional uh, owners of these major corporations. And the ownership of those groups you cannot identify. So I'll just skip ahead by telling you and then challenge you. you can, I'll invite you to check me out and reach out to me if you, if you for, for any reason. But, but if you find anything that contradicts this, I'd be happy to hear it. The dominant institutional private equity group, or dominant institutional investor is a private equity in almost anything, anything, is a group called the Vanguard Group. And there's a great interview we have at our mixwhatilike.org. We have a lot, by the way, we have a lot of interviews. I've, I've you know, and I've invite, we've, de I've debated Jeff Chang, I've debated Bakari Kitwana, I've debated um, whoever. We invite them on our show, we invite them to the website to dialogue, a friendly debate, not hostile, friendly debate, discussion. We've critiqued Trisha Rose's Hip Hop Wars. Her first book was so much better. Hip Hop Wars is, is, is truly limited uh, in its focus on commercial hip hop without understanding or talking about the, how commercial hip hop gets developed. Um, uh, uh, um, we, but we invite conversation and debate and exchange, and, and we would invite you to join that. But, but what I've said to my classes is that when you look up what it says about Vanguard Group, they're the dominant. Uh, we have a great interview. This is what I was going to say with, with, with Homeboy Sandman, a brilliant MC right out of here in Queens, New York. Um, phenomenal MC. And he wrote a great article a couple of years ago that exposed the relationship between private equity groups that own our dominant media and also own the private prison system, making the point that you can promote, as this is what C. Dolores Suckle was saying, you can promote an image of blackness that encourages and justifies police violence and oppression and mass incarceration, but then would also encourage among black youth behavior that would get them caught up in those systems and have everybody owning it, the same people owning it on both ends. We encourage you to go to jail, and when you go to jail, we then profit off of that. Conspiracy, you can call me conspiracy theorist, but as Ishmael Reed says, you would have to then acknowledge yourself as a coincidence theorist. Um, but this is where I was in. When you look up the Vanguard group it, and you try to say, well, who's in this Vanguard group? It will literally tell you on the website, the members of the Vanguard group are the investors in the Vanguard group. End quote, full stop. So my point is we're not even meant to know who are the dominant owners who benefit financially off of what we get, who benefit politically and ideologically off of what is dominantly passed around for us to, to consider as a range of ideas and acceptable choices and behavior. And they continue to benefit while materially all the communities that produce this art, this wonderful cultural expression and all of its elements are getting worse and worse and worse. We have the same less than 2% of the national wealth that black people had at the end of enslavement. And words. There's just so many more. I just keep, I've, I've run off. So anyway, I'll stop there. Um, please check out imixwhatilike.org or at imixwhatilike for all your relevant social media for more on all of this. Uh, and as Fred Hampton used to say, I'll end as he did by saying to you, we say peace if you're willing to fight for it. So peace, everybody. And thank you very much.